Okay, uh, enough of my yak, and who we really want to hear from is uh, Jose Cobos. He's a full professor at the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, and he's the chair of the Industrial Council at CEI. And uh, he's here, lucky for us, because he's on a uh, visiting sabbatical at UC Berkeley, which we're catching him towards the end of. So, no further ado, please join me in welcoming Jose. Hello. Okay, thank you all for, for coming. It is my pleasure to be here with you. And what I would like to share today with you is a metric to compare our architectures. Yeah. A metric to compare our architectures. We developed this for the Google Little Box Challenge when we participated in, in there. And we feel it like uh, very useful. But the basic concept of this was published the first time in 1966. So it is over 50 years ago. And um, perhaps what you can find here is the way we apply that. So what is what we are calling the difference of power? What we call the difference of power is what the... It's going to be Okay. No, it should be fine. Okay, so what it is is the minimum possible value of what some people call the AC power on, or the indirect power or what we call the internal power of the converter. <coughs> and it is basically the power that is processed by the components of your converter. And that is not the same as the nominal power and the reason is that there is some direct power that flows from the input to, of your, from the source of your converter to the load without causing any losses or any volume in your converter. And it is not either the some concept that you may find which is the differential power converters or the parcel power. In those cases, the objective is to reduce the nominal power of the converters. And this is something a bit uh, different. So let me give you just um, a couple of examples of that. Imagine a back converter like this one. Okay, it is 10 volt at the input, 50% duty cycle, 5 volt at the output. Okay? In those two places, any arbitrary voltage, let's say 1000 volt. Then for the same components, that is for the same inductor and the same switches, working under the same condition, the output power would be... Would We are just adding 1,000 volt on that. So the power of that power converter is 10 kilovolt, but you can use any arbitrary voltage. So the same components working in the, the same conditions may be providing arbitrary amounts of power to the load. What is identical in those two cases is the differential power, that is the power that is processed by the components. So another example which is very well known is where to compare a back converter with a back push converter for the same electrical specifications. Let's say in this case 100 watt in both cases, 100 volt in the input, 50 volt in the output. Of course in the back boost it is reversed, but if you make the calculations you can see that the current through the inductor is 2 amps in this case, and the current in the inductor in the back boost is 3 amps, and the voltage rating in the devices it is 100 volt in the back converter, it is 150 volt in the back boost. So for the same electrical specifications, you have a factor of slightly higher than 2, both in the VA rating or in the volume of the intact. So the nominal power in this case is identical, it is 100 watt, but the differential power, that is the power processed by the components, is very different. So let me put this in context. We developed this metric to compare many possible architectures for inverters, for PV panels, in the Little Box Challenge. The goal there was to achieve the smallest possible inverter. So volume was important, cost was not that important. There was a winner, which is CET, if you follow that, in which the reference was 40 cubic inch, and they did 14 cubic inch. We projected 12.9 uh, cubic inch in a topology which is different from what you have seen from all the finalists, but it didn't work at that time, 
And we are still working on that. But we are still working on that because we feel it is a nice approach and it is important. So that is what I want to describe. And the methodology that we follow there is somehow inspired in the two-input back converter, which was published in 1996. And then when I was discussing this metric now at UC Berkeley with, uh, with Seth Sanders, then what he did is he gave me a doctoral dissertation what was uh, published there in 1969. And looking at the reference in there, there was a previous work which was from 1966. So what I'm going to describe is what is the essence there and how, how we apply that. Okay. Okay, so basically what we have when we have any uh, power converter with the nominal power P is that we have a power that flows from source to load without producing any losses. That is something which we are not normally used to do that. So there is only a part of the power which is processed through the components. You store that in inductance capacitors and then you deliver that to the load. So basically we can define the differential power as the difference between the nominal power and this direct power that you can find there. And the real power that you process is, in many cases, higher than that limit. So the differential power is the minimum possible value of that internal power. So normally what we would like to do in any converter is to maximize the direct power in order to minimize the internal power. And the limit that you can reach, and that is the good thing, is the differential power. So one thing that you can do is for any converter, calculate that direct power, then calculate that differential power, and then that will have an impact on your volume and losses. But in many cases, you don't process that differential power. You process more power than that. An example are switch capacitors, for instance. You are transferring energy from some components to other. So the internal power that you process is higher than that. And in some cases, you add a transformer to do the voltage conversion. So basically, if you want to account for all the internal power that is processed, you should amp all those terms that you have there. OK, once you have that, you can see, or you would guess, that a converter that processes less power would be smaller than another one which processes more power. So something that you can do with once you calculate this differential power is apply that for the reactive components and also apply the VR rating, calculate the limit of the VR rating of the devices. That limit that you can see there, you can find in these publications that I mentioned from 66 and 69. So now the question is, if you select a converter in which you are in the limit, in the lower limit, both of the VA rating and the differential power, in principle it should be smaller. If you go to any other case, it would be higher. And if you are working, let's say, processing the power through inductors, then that would um, be always like that. The higher the power, the higher the volume. But if you work with switch capacitors, then you can find that some topologies, for instance, a series parallel converter in which you are in the limit for the reactive components, but you are over the limit of the VA rating of the device, may be perhaps as good, it depends on the application, as being on the limit of the VA uh, rating of the switches, but not in the limit of the differential power. So basically the key question that you can see there is what would be, once you calculate that, once you are able to calculate in your converter, what is the power process through transformer, inductor, capacitor, and you know the VA rating, what is the impact of your converter? Because if it has some impact, then the metric is valid. If it doesn't, then it is not that, that simple. So in the case of the power process through inductors, you can make some calculations and obtain an equation, and it has very direct impact between the power process through inductors and the real volume and losses in your converter. So in that case, you can ap apply that. If you're talking about switch caps or resonance switch caps, then you have to check in more detail, and the conclusion is not that evident. And in the case of uh, converters in which you have just a voltage conversion ratio, that is a DCX, then again you have to compare the transformer with the inductor. So in those cases it is not very elaborated, but in the cases in which you process the energy through inductors, it is. Okay? So basically what uh, perhaps you can do, or what at least we do, or what we did in this Google Little Boss Challenge, is you have some specifications, and then you have a number of different possible alternatives, which are perhaps all those that you have there. So what is the typical approach? Or what you would do, what you would do is optimize. So you may choose 
choose all those alternatives, optimize for different tools, the inductors, the switches, everything, and then once you optimize every single alternative that you might consider, then you could compare, and then you could finally implement one of your designs. Normally, what you do is you say, okay, I have enough expertise in this, I'm not going to try so many alternatives because I know what I have to do, and then you choose directly one of those. Okay, what uh, has been very interesting for us is to calculate, to make the calculation of the power, the real power processed by the components, so we add a block in there which helps us in the optimization process or even help us to define new inverters and new modulations, that is what we did, and then we finally implemented a different alternative to the initial alternatives that you would have done. So for us, it is very illuminating. I mean, now, every time we see a designer, a new converter, I try to think on the power, the real power that is processed by the components and not just the nominal, the nominal power. Now, another step to do is what is the impact, if there is an automatic impact from those powers to the real product so that you can save part of the optimization process. Okay, so now the key point is how to calculate those things, how to calculate the power processed by the components. But above all, what is really interesting is to calculate the power at system level, even without knowing what is the specific circuit that you have inside the building blocks. And then you can calculate that for many different converters. I'm not going for the question of time, dedicate or calculate all of those, but I'm going to focus on this energy buffer Converter. So I'm going to calculate what are the limits of that and then to compare the different typical architectures and then to show you something about our prototype. Although, as I said at the beginning, we have partial results. We don't have the full, full results on that. Okay, so this was the Google Little Box Challenge competition. I guess you are aware of this. It is just an inverter, single phase inverter, no isolation in which the input voltage is 400 volt and the input current has to be very constant. So the input power is uh, constant and the output power is pulsating and the key point to win the competition was volume. And they expected a reduction of 10 times compared to the typical commercial products. And they identified four technical challenges which are all those that you see there. Okay, so basically what it is, it is an energy buffer converter. And it is not the only case. I mean, uh, in this case, you have an inverter from PV panels or batteries in which the input power is constant. So you have AC power in the AC side, so you have to store some energy. But it is basically the same application as the typical application of power factor correction in which you need constant DC in the output and you have constant AC. And then you need some storage in your converter. So basically what happens there is, as you know very well, is that the input power is constant and the output power is pulsating, in this case from 0 to 4 kilowatts, and those are the, the waveforms. You, you have a waveform from, from 0 to 4 kilowatts and back to 0 with the average value of 2 kilowatts, so the capacitor needs to store the, those 2 kilowatts along the line, the line cycle. You can calculate the energy that you need to store, you can calculate the ripple as a, as a function of your capacitor, and the volume of your capacitor, which is what was important here, is dependent on the discharge ratio. It is not dependent on the voltage of the bus, but it is dependent on the discharge ratio, because it is dependent on the volume that, uh, on the energy, the maximum energy that you need to store. You can plot that, the volume of the capacitor. If you completely discharge it, you have a value of C. And so the point is that if you want to have very low discharge ratio, then the capacitor goes to infinite. So you don't want to work there, but you don't need also to go to that area because it is very flat. Just a small variation in the in your capacitor uh, produces a lower uh, discharge ratio. So to give you a number, just if you have 30% discharge ratio, you need 2 times C, and if you wanted to avoid an active converter at the input of the inverter, you would need 17 times that value, which is something which is not acceptable. So you can, again, see that non-linearity there. For 65 micro, you would be discharging completely the capacitor. As long as you go to 70 micro, you can see that it goes up a lot. Then 90 micro again. 130 micro, you have a 30% discharge ratio, which is something rather good. And if you wanted very low ripple, you would have a very, very high value. But the key point is that at system level, the capacitor is the key parameter in order to know the voltages and currents in the three ports of your converter. So now, 
I would like to ask you a question. You want to compete, you want to win the $1 million, you are there thinking about to do the best ever converter. So you could think, what is the worst operating point of that converter? Because my question would be, okay, for that specific point, I mean, along the line cycle, what would be your optimum topology? So what is the worst point? The most critical point, the point in which you are going to have the higher losses. Which one? You could say when you have the maximum power, when you are in the peak of the power, you could think that is the worst point. At that point, you need to transfer two kilowatts from input to output and two kilowatts from the capacitor to the output. Well, in reality, <coughs> that is not going to be the worst point, as we'll see later on. But in principle, we thought, I also thought, that that was the worst point. So I chose a 70 micron case, microfarads, and then I chose that point, the point of maximum power, which is this one. So here we have two kilowatt, four kilowatt, we have two kilowatt in the output, two kilowatt the storage capacitor. Those are the voltages for that specific case, 340 volts for the output voltage, 295 for the capacitor, and these are the currents. It is five amps in the output, in, in the input, 6.7 the storage capacitor, 11.7 at the output. That sum, I mean, the fact that 5 plus 6.7 is equal to 11.7 happens only at that point if I choose 70 micron. So this is only for this specific case, okay? But anyway, it is good to illustrate what I want to illustrate. And what I want to illustrate is what would be the optimum topology to work in that point? What is what you want to do? So basically what you want to do are two things. You want to transfer charge from the input to the output. You want to transfer some positive charges there, which are electrons going in the other direction. That is something that you want to do. And you can also transfer charge from the capacitor to the output. In principle, there are two different uh, functions that you want to perform. So if you try to go to the physics, you would say, okay, to transfer one single charge, I would need some energy to transfer that energy, that charge from one point to another. If I want to transfer many charges, I mean, I want to transfer a current of five amps, then the power that I need to, sorry, that I release, that uh, these charges release when they pass from 400 volt to three, 440 volt, it is 300 watt. That energy is being released. And what you want to do in the other case, which is this one, is to transfer charge from 295 to 340. And in that case, what you need is to inject some energy, to provide some energy to those charges. And if you want a current of 6.7 amps, then the amount of power that you need is 300 watt. So in principle, there are two different processes. One is from the source, the other one is from the storage capacitor, but I chose 70 micron so that those two values are identical. And now, <clears throat> the question is, okay, if it is the same value, and although it is only for 70 micron, but I chose this case, my, my question is, is it possible to combine both processes? I mean, can I use the, the energy that is released from one process to transfer the charge from the other process? And basically what we want to do is this. What we want to do is to transfer 5 amps from here to here, and 6.7 amps from here to here, and we want to transfer 300 watts from this process to that process, as simple as that. That is all we want to do. So the question is, can we do that process, that energy transfer, with a very simple converter? And the answer is yes, and it is as simple as that. With just one inductor, you are able to transfer 5 amps from here and 6.7 to here, so that you have 11 point seven there. And the power there is just 300 watt. That converter is a 300 watt converter, but you are transferring four kilowatt to the output. So the size, the volume, and the losses of this converter is the one of a 300 watt converter. So it is 7.5% of the four kilowatts. So it is a tiny amount, and with those components, you are able to do that. So you could have many questions now. You could say, okay, what about the other architectures? Are they processing? What is the power that they are processing? Or how do you calculate the direct power and the power in the inductor? Or 
can you extend this to the whole to the whole cycle? Can you do a real converter? Imagine that you compare with a two-stage approach. And of course you don't need to use a backboost converter, but you could, some people could use a flyback, a backboost, or whatever. In that case, the backboost is processing the whole nominal power. So at that specific moment, sorry, at that specific moment, this converter would be processing two kilowatts to charge this capacitor, and this capacitor would be providing four kilowatts to the output. So in total, you would be processing in your components six kilowatts, that is 20 times the power that you are processing in the other, in the other case. And that makes a difference. <clears throat> if you compare with an active filter, like this one, which is another typical approach, then again here, what you have is four kilowatts here and two kilowatts here. So it is identical. So it is 20 times higher power than in the other case. So how can we calculate that direct power on what is the grounds for having such a low power? Okay, if you have a, a current flowing through a loop like this, you have the input voltage, inductor, capacitor, and, and output uh, voltage in the load, there are several processes or several things happening. You are taking energy from the input source. You're also changing the energy that you store in the inductor. You are changing the energy stored in the capacitor, and you are providing energy to the load. So the same current is being used to perform different functions, depending on how is your circuit. So this is as simple as that. Let's give some examples at a given time. Just at a given time, imagine that you have this circuit and you have one amp flowing in that path. So you could calculate and you could say, okay, one amp multiplied by 12 volts, this source is providing 12 watts, this one is absorbing 7 watts, this is absorbing 4 watts, and the power, the load is receiving 1 watt. What means that uh, the energy is flowing in those directions and the direct power that is flowing from the input to the load without causing any effect on the other components is, in this case, just 1 watt. But that watt is not affecting the size of the volume of the other components. That is the direct, that is the definition of the direct power. And it is the direct current multiplied by, in this case, by one volt. Note that it is the lowest, the smallest possible value, the minimum value between 12 volt and one volt, okay? You can do the opposite in the opposite direction. You may have one volt here, 12 volt here, minus 15, plus four. And again, you have one amp flowing in the circuit. And then the power level, if you calculate that, the powers that you have is one watt going from the source. You are receiving 12 watts at the load, but then the power flow is that there is one watt flowing from the source to the load directly, and then the inductor is providing some energy to the capacitor, and the inductor is providing the rest of the power, that is 11 watt, to the load. So again, the direct power is, in this case, the direct current that you calculated multiplied again by the minimum value of the input and output, which in this case, it is the input voltage, not the output voltage. But again, this is direct power. This power is not affecting volume or losses. <clears throat> so you can calculate the, also the power in an inductor, the average power that you uh, that the inductor is processing, and you can do that just by calculating how much energy gets in and how much energy gets out. And then that power is basically the product of voltage multiplied by current and average by the duty cycle, and then the same voltage by current multiplied by the one minus duty cycle. And obviously, both values have to be identical because the energy that comes in is the energy that goes out. Okay, so you can calculate this direct power in the converter, and you can do for many, I mean, for every converter that you want. Note that in some cases, the current that is flowing from input to output is negative. It can make a loop. That is the case, for instance, of the C source inverter, and the direct power will be negative. So your differential power will be even higher. But we are going to calculate that for our converter, our 300 watt converter. So we have this duty cycle, 0.425. We have those two kilowatts and the four kilowatts in there. And we can calculate what is the circuit during the own time, which is as simple as this. So there are 11.7 amps, which is the output current flowing from the source. 
And you can calculate also, or you can draw the circuit when you have the main switch off, that is, you have this switch on, and you have the output current flowing through the capacitor. And then you can calculate the power in those uh, two circuits. And in this case, the power that you calculate is that um, there are two kilowatts being provided by the input voltage source, in which 300 of them go to the inductor, and the other 1.7 kilowatt are going directly to the load without causing any loss or anything in your components. If you do the same calculation for the uh, time one minus D, what you can see is that the inductor is providing 300 watts, the 300 watts that it got here. You're providing that to the load, and this capacitor is providing for free two kilowatts. So that in total you have, during this stage, 2.3 kilowatts, and in this case you have 1.7, so total you have 4 kilowatts. So that is the process how a simple converter like this is just processing 300 watts to provide 4 kilowatts. And that makes a difference compared to processing a higher amount of power. Okay, but the good thing, the good thing is not to calculate that once you know the circuit, but the good thing is that you can make the calculations at system level, even with knowing the specific circuit that you have. So what you can do is to draw the direct current between the input source and the load, and <clears throat> then the direct power will be this direct current averaged there in your circuit multiplied by the minimum value during the input voltage and the load. Okay, so note again that in a backboost converter, for instance, the direct current is zero, and in some converters the direct current may be even negative. Okay, so let's try to calculate that average model. What is what we can do? Once you draw that direct current into here, you can notice that there is a voltage drop, a voltage difference here between those two terminals, which is the input voltage minus the output voltage. That is the differential voltage there. And therefore, the power that is needs to be processed by this building block, but this source is the direct current multiplied by that difference. So that power needs in the end to be delivered and to will go out of this block to some other terminals of your converter. So that the total power in your model needs to be zero, obviously. Okay? So the total amount of positive powers and the total amount of negative powers need to be equal, so the total sum is the total sum is zero. Okay, so let's go to a generic case of a step down converter. In a step down, imagine this circuit 12 volt, 1 volt, 1 amp, 12 amps. So you have here a voltage difference of 11 volt. So what is the current that you could draw here? The current that you could draw is just 1 amp. Okay, so if you draw that current, one amp there, what you can see is that the direct power is one amp multiplied by one volt, that is just one watt of direct power, and then 11 watts of differential power. And those 11 watts need to be identical to the other current source that you need to connect here, so that one amp is coming here, you need another 11 amp coming in there, and 11 multiplied by one is one watt, which is identical to that value. So everything makes sense. And basically what you get as an expression is that the internal power or the differential power is the nominal power multiplied by 1 minus VO over V in. If you repeat the process for the boost converter or for a step up, then it is just, I mean, it is, if it were bidirectional, then the, the way of thinking is exactly the same. So you can plot there 1 amp and then the direct power is 1 watt and then that source is delivering 11 watt, and those 11 watt come from the source to that other current source. So it is identical to the previous case, and you have a very similar expression, but now changing VO over VE in your expression. In the back boost, you cannot find any direct path for the current, so the input current comes this way, and the other one comes that way, and that is because the voltage is in the opposite direction. Okay, so in that case, the differential power is the nominal power, which is P. So the converter is processing the total total power of the converter. Okay, if you plot that, you can see that uh, 
if you plot here the duty cycle or the gain, you can see that in the back boost it is processing the nominal power for any voltage gain, but in a back converter, the closer the input voltage comes to the input voltage, then the less power you need to process because the higher amount is direct power. And the opposite happens to the boost converter, which in the end is the same. If the input and the output are closer, then your converter is processing very little power. So this is what you get, and the good thing of that is not for a back converter or or a step-up converter like that. But the good thing is when you think on this energy buffer converter. Because in this energy buffer converter, you know everything. You know the output voltage that you want. You know the discharge ratio that you want to have, because you choose your capacitor. And then you know the current, the output current. You know the input current. You know the current in the storage capacitor, and you know what is the, po and the, and the power. So you know voltages and currents in the three ports. So the question is, how could you arrange your circuit so that the internal power is minimum? How can you do your circuit in such a way that uh, the components need to process the minimum possible current? So it depends on where you are. If you are in this case, I mean, if the current provided by this capacitor is positive, then what you see is that the power in the load, it could be the case of the four kilowatts, so this would be five amps, this would be whatever it can be. In the previous case, it was 6.7, so you don't need this current source. But if, it is, if the sum is lower than the output current, then you need to complete the model with the difference of those currents. So this would be the optimum. And you can define the same depending on what are the currents. So the goal here is to say, OK, if this port provides this current and this other port needs this current, and so how can I draw the circuit so that the voltage in the current sources is minimal. So if you do that, you can do that for the different stages, and then by doing so in the different intervals, you would require different circuits. You would require different converters, different topologies. And that is the reality. But the point is that you can calculate in each of these circuits what is the power that is being processed by each current source. And the total sum of those powers needs obviously to be zero. Okay, if you make that calculation, what you get is this. What you get is that uh, these are the individual powers from those current sources. And what is marked here is the maximum value of the all. So that is the total power, the maximum power that is being processed by the components. You can check at this point. Sorry. You can check at this point, which was the one for the four kilowatts, that you get the 300 watt that we calculated before. But you can see that this point is much worse than that other point. That is, the internal power processing at this specific point is far higher than this one at this other point. Anyway, the average value of that is 478 watt, again, sorry, which is 24%. Okay, so that is, that is the best possible that you can do with any converter, any inverter that you would think of. So how can you implement that? How can you implement that inverter? Well, the thing is to try to use the same current for several functions. So what we saw before was in the discharging phase, um, but here it would be in the charging phase, what you would need is when this current and this current are lower than this one, what you would need is to use the current in the inductor to provide energy both for the capacitor and both for the resistor. And what you would need when you are in the discharging phase is something as we saw before, is to take energy from the input to the load and also from the capacitor to the load. So you would need something like this. So you can see that what you need in the discharging phase is different than what you need in the charging phase. So what we thought, one of the preliminary ideas is, OK, perhaps we can do that in order to use the same current for different things. What we can do is to close this switch in this converter and close this path, charge the inductor with the same current that we provide to the load. And then we open here, and then we deliver this charge, we deliver that to the capacitor. So we are combining those two stages, let's say, to perform two functions, that is, to provide energy to the load and then to provide energy to the capacitor. 
But note that this is a boost effect, so this voltage will be higher than this one. Okay. Then, in order to match all the powers, then you need to take this, this energy from here and provide there and to achieve the regulation. So, in principle, that looks like a good idea because you are like combining two stages, and then we calculated the differential power in order to check whether it was a good idea. So we plotted the waveforms, which are the external waveforms, and then we plotted the power that was processed, processed by each component, but not the nominal power, I mean not the output power, but the differential power, the power processed by the components. And you get this value for the main converter and this other value for the auxiliary converter, and that is the total, and then what you get is 0.47. That is, we are processing around 900 watts in this case. So was it good or was it bad? It was in any case far from the minimum possible that you could get. So what we did is to propose another architecture similar to that one, and then to compare with the typical ones that you would expect, the two stage, the filter, the three stage, and then we propose these two converters, and then we try the single stage converter. And then we made the comparison, and this is what we got. We tried first for high voltage, for 600 volt, that is to use high step up stages in the DC to DC converter and then the inverter. And then this is the internal power processed by the two modules. Not that we don't know what is the topology. We are working with the optimum possible topology for every that building block. And the total power is that, like that. And then you can see that it is 0.64. So it is not a good value. I mean, it is really far. It is. 1300 watt in here, and it is worse than the other circuit that we calculated also boosting the voltage. But then we check another architecture, in this case also for 600 volt in the capacitor, and then using the active filter, we again calculated the minimum power that needs to be processed, and it was 0.42, that is 830 watt, which was better than the previous case, but our design was worse than this. So in principle, the active filter is the one that was better for this case. You can see the comparison of the all, the total power of both cases, and you can see that this is the worst. These are not too far, but the active filter is the best one for 600 volt. But going up in the voltage is not a good idea. So we decided to try with a maximum voltage in the capacitor of 400 and 30% discharge radio. Now, you have to be careful here because the voltage in the capacitor may be smaller than the output voltage. So you cannot use, in some, during some times you need to use a step down converter and some other times you need to use a step up. So the comparison in some cases would require two different converters, one for stepping down or for stepping up. So it is not that trivial. But in any case, we made the comparison. If you have the combination of both converters, you would get these two, but you can discard them because they, they would require three converters into your system. So basically, what you get is this value, which is for the active filter. Okay? But again, you can compare very easily what are the powers. So we made also the comparison for 20% discharge ratio so that we didn't have that problem of combining two topologies. And now, in this case, you get a very nice value for the two-stage converter. It is better in this case than the active filter. So it is processing less power. And the problem is that to obtain a 20% discharge ratio, you need a bigger capacitor. And that means that perhaps you don't win the competition. But perhaps it is good for low-cost application. And that is why two-stage is broadly used in many cases. OK, we also check increasing the discharge rate to 40%, in which you only can use, in this case, the active filter from that comparison. And then you get a better value there. You get the best value comparing to the others. And in fact, this was the approach used by most of the team. So you could say, OK, by optimizing my circuit, I come to the same conclusion. And that is true, but in this case, you have the information ahead. I mean, you have, you know that that is what you can do. So now, if you plot the different solutions, what we have compared for 600 volt in the bus, and you plot here the discharge ratio, and here the normalized differential power that we have been calculated, you can see that for this discharge ratio, you will have a large value of the capacitor, but you can calculate that anyway. I mean, but you would discard for the competition these two, and in these cases, all these 
basically you would need um, two converters to step up and down. So basically the conclusion here is that for 600 volt the active filter would be the best possible design and that would be the power. And if you go to the 400 volt bus, then what you would get is again that the active filter is the best value, okay, compared to others because this one you cannot use because of the step up and step down approach. So that is basically the comparison there and what I'm going to tell you now or to describe is what we did in order to do a single stage and in order to try to approach that limit in the power processing. So basically what we used is, here is just a number of switches, and we have just the three ports that we have been describing so far, and then we have just one inductor, okay? I plotted outside just to um, note that there is only one inductor in the circuit, and then we open and close the switches there so that we try to, sorry, to process the energy so that Sorry. So that the energy and the current is exactly the current that we want to have in each different port. Okay. So what we did is something which is very interesting is that the same topology, the same power topology, depending on the modulation that you do, depending on what are the voltages that you apply to the inductor, then you have different operation modes for a given point. I mean, this is the... Um, the cycle, the sinusoidal cycle, and here what you can do is that you can operate the converter in one operation mode or in a com another different operation mode to obtain exactly the same current and voltages in all the ports, but the internal power that is processed by your components is completely different. And that happens, you can calculate that for your whole line cycle, you can plot all the different operations mode that you may guess, and obviously you would select the one with minimal internal processing. And this is variable frequency, so you can again plot the switching frequency of your circuit and you have a very variable switching frequency in your device. But you, what you get there is that the internal power processed by the inductor is 385 watts, which is 0.19. Then if you compare that plot with the theoretical value, what you can say is that the theoretical limit was this one, and the red one is the one that we get in the inductor, or the power that is processed through the inductor. So you can see that it is very different. Here it is slightly higher, and here it is lower, and here it is clearly lower. And the reason why it is lower is that this is the power processed by the inductor, but the storage capacitor is processing at the switching frequency the other part of the energy. So basically you are very well, and the total number that we got is this one. So basically what we are doing is that uh, this inverter in one, just one single stage is processing almost half of the internal power that is processing the one with the active filter that was selected by most of the things and that you would really do. So what uh, you could say now is, okay, if you are processing half of the power, you would get a better result, and the problem is that we face so many problems in the implementation that we have to work in order to, to solve them, and I hope we are very close to solve them. In fact, we are just in testing now the, the third prototype of that. So this is the first one, the first prototype that we built. We use gallium nitrous, we had zero voltage switching in all the devices. This is uh, different parts, the drivers and everything, and this was how it looked like you have the switches on one side and then sensors and drivers on, on the other side. And we had partial results, so we couldn't validate everything at that moment. We could validate two different things. We could validate that the concept was uh, right. I mean, we were able to generate a sinusoid. That yellow signal represents the change in the different operation modes, but at that time we couldn't take the voltage higher than 40 volts. I mean, we could get the nominal current, but not the full voltage. And the reason was that uh, the devices would break. We had a lot of problems with the drivers, with the gun devices, and so on. But we also made some tests at the full power. This was one phase from one kilowatt, and um, the output power was one kilowatt here, and the total losses was eight watts. So we got 99% efficiency working with the differential power equivalent to the average differential power. So we hope to have good results soon, 
but we don't have yet. So what you have to take away from here is not the converter, is would be the methodology in case you consider that it is interesting. I see um, since we developed that, we calculate this internal power in any single converter that we do or that we see. I mean, I feel this is very illuminating. And of course, it is not dependent on the technology. If you say, okay, uh, now I use this technology or I use this other technology, you are going to use to obtain completely different results. But at least it is good to compare at this level. And then depending on the technology that you implement, you get one thing or another. And for instance, something that uh, is convenient to do if you do, for instance, hybrid converters in which you combine inductors and capacitors, then it would be good to know the ratio or the impact of this power that you process through inductors or capacitors into the overall system. So here you can see what is the result of a MATLAB optimization of those converters. So what you get is a plot like this, okay, for a specific multi-level converter, and this is what you calculate at this level. So you can see that there is some correlation between what you get after the optimization and the amount of power, the internal power that you are processing. So I would say that the, to summarize, the messages would be your components are processing a different amount of power than your converter. And it is important to know that because it has some impact on your final volume and losses. And that's it from my side. What we got are partial results, which is this, which were are promising but are not the final results. But the good thing is that at least at the high level, they have half of the power than most of the other alternatives that you would guess. And that's it. This is the, I hope that you have some questions at least. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So my question is, um, I just missed a step. So you were showing um, how you optimized and you looked at kind of like across all the, the possible circuits and you found an optimal value um, by just using two stages or an active filter. And then you showed a different plot showing that you actually got a better result. How, what is the step between? So you measure a, a theoretical limit and then you manage to find something that was lower than that? The point there, the theoretical limit the theoretical limit is the power that needs to be processed by your components. And what we calculated in our specific inverter was the power processed by the inductors. So the power processed by the inductors plus the capacitor should be above the limit. So it is not possible that you get anything below the limit. Correct. But the point is that we are there. I mean, we are not in twice the power. But obviously, what you get cannot be lower than the limit. Is the, the power processed by the converter, is it, is it a good indicator of, the, of losses? Is, the, is this a good uh, catalyzer to to utilization of devices? How is it related to the parameters that we usually... I think from that value that you calculate, if you compare several alternatives, okay, if you implement them all in the same way, that is with the same technology, I mean silicon or gallium nitride, these dielectrics or these other magnetic materials, there would, should be a clear correlation. Okay? And in the case of inductors, in the, in the case that the power is processed through the inductors, there is a direct correlation. It is very clear. But now you can do something else. You can do is, this is my limit, but I can process the power through inductors, or I can use switch capacitors, 
or a hybrid architecture. So then you are doing a share between inductors and capacitors. And then the impact on size, losses, and everything is different if you process inductors or if you process through capacitors. So you have to be careful about that. So it might happen that a converter with higher internal power could be smaller than another one with lower internal power if they are processing the power through the capacitors instead of inductors. Is that clear? No. Uh, you had an equation up there about um, the power, um, basically one minus V out of Vn or vice versa. It seems that would indicate that you don't want a large conversion voltage. You don't want very high in and very low out or vice versa. Is that right. true? Is that absolutely true? That means that making a voltage conversion requires power. So if you think, okay, we could go to 1500 volt in the bus, and because I have new devices which are, which stand very high voltage, and then I go down, okay, you can do that, but the power, the internal power that you are processing is much higher. You could say again, okay, I process more power, but I do it with a different technology that is much better than this other, okay, then you are down in the in the flow chart, okay? You say, okay, I process more power, but in a better way, okay, you are okay. But you are processing, of course, higher power. So you have to be careful about that. So the less, the less you convert, the better, always. Any other questions? I'll snag that for me, John. Well, actually, well, I have a question. So, um, you know, considering you, you have a, you know, a major dependence on the, on the capacitor that's buffering the, the power, how, do, how does it react when you, uh, you know, in terms of short circuit protection? And, and I imagine this is a different question um, based on if it's on the input or the output side um, in an inverter. Um, can you comment on, on, on how it yeah, how much that's, it that's a very good point because not only short circuit protection but also load steps or a step from resistive to reactive load. I mean, you may have some changes in the, I mean, some steps in the power either at the output. So the key point is that in this application what you want is to have constant power in principle. Okay? So if you have a load step, a big load step, a power step, that energy comes either from your storage capacitor or from your input. So you have to design the loops in such a way that you take the energy from one side or another. Imagine that you want constant current on the input to protect your input or whatever. Then what would be limiting the size of your capacitor is not only the discharge rate that you have, the voltage that you have there, but it would be the amount of energy that you need to provide to the load. And the same with whole at time if you do. I mean, if you want to consider the dynamics, we did, of course, to meet all the uh, load steps and power factor steps that we have in the specifications, but that is a constraint. I mean, you cannot reduce the, the, vol the, the value of the capacitor not only because of the voltage discharge rate that you would have at that point, but also in terms of the amount of energy that you need to provide. So that is a critical point. You need to know what you want to do. So if you have a load step up or down, that energy flows or goes to a different to a point. And you decide that depending on the loops that you do. Okay. So you could take more energy either from the storage capacitor or more energy from the input. It depends on what you want to do. And you have to dimension both capacitors and the input and the storage capacitor according to those load steps. So it is a critical point. Yeah. What else? Actually, no, what, one more quick one. So I understand that, you know, this was not a high volume, uh, you know, production design or anything like that. But um, as, assuming it, it, it was, you know, and, and again, this has nothing to do with cost, but um, how, how carefully and tightly would you have to manage your, your capacitor source now? I mean, it seems like you would have a, a much lesser tolerance. Uh, well, excuse me, you, 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 you can accept much, much lower, uh, well, you would require tighter tolerance control, uh, I think, to, to guarantee the, the, the performance of, of, the, uh, of the power processing, you know, in, in, that, in that tight 
tight window. Is that would that be a you know a concern or I guess a challenge in in a in a high volume application? I don't think so. I wouldn't expect a problem. I mean, the point is, if you compare to the two states, that's true. What you mean is that the energy storage is in the middle, in the case of the two states, or in the case with the active filter you have in a different place. Okay, and here you have it let's say in the middle of the converter. It is part of the, uh, your main inverter. But in terms of energy flow, at the end it's the same. It, it's what I described before. So you need to look at what are your power steps or your load steps in order to size the capacitors accordingly. But you have to do that in this case, but also in the two-stage architecture. So perhaps there is a difference, but I don't see that. I mean, if you have that step, in a two-stage architecture, again, that energy comes from somewhere, and in that case, comes specifically from the the capacitor in the bus. So you need to dimension that capacitor for those load steps that you want to have. And in this case, I think it is the it is similar. I don't see a big difference. But it's true that you have to take that into account. I mean, you, but it happens in both cases. I mean, if you put a very small capacitor, your capacitor would discharge in both cases, and in both cases, it would create problems. So you need to have entire energy store there to account for the for the load step. All right, thank you. So you used CAN transistors to do this, yes. uh, but you said you had some challenges. Yes. What challenges did you encounter, and how did you try overcoming them? Many problems. With the driving of the GAN transistors, there we face many problems. So we had some problems. We couldn't raise the voltage. I mean, at the beginning, we built a standard back converter, DC to DC converter, that's it. And it worked very, very well. Everything was very stable. We could go to 2 kilowatt. We made all the thermal tests. Everything ran very, very smoothly. When we implemented the inverter, then I guess that because of the DVDT and I mean the gate driver circuit was not okay, so we tried many different alternatives just to try to dump the noise and everything, and we couldn't go in that specific moment beyond 40 volts. Now we are again in the 400 volts, so our prototype now is working with 400 volts, it is okay, but we have some problems with the with the drivers, a lot of problems with them, and we also had problems with the control. The control is could be really complicated, finally we, we solved it, but it is CVS in all the transitions in order to, to avoid switching losses. So we have a very specific sequence, a very specific timing in order to achieve CVS in all, in each individual transistor. And at the beginning we thought that the DSP would be enough because there are six hardware interrupts, so we thought, okay, you sense when the current is here and then you open the switch and you open the other. But finally you cannot because all, they all go to the same same channel. So we have to use an FPGA and then we have to program all the control in an FPGA and that was again a delay and then we implemented that for reactive, I mean and not only resistive but also inductive and capacitive loads and so I mean the control that I didn't describe here or anything, it is a real challenge because you are doing something very sophisticated. The power topology is very simple but the control is tricky but it works. I mean it uh, you had to go to ZVS to actually also control the noise that you were getting on the gate. Okay, of course. So, I mean, it, it wasn't is. only for efficiency. Yeah, again, I didn't show, but I could show. We made in this preliminary converter, in the back converter, the 2 kilowatt, we made some tests with and without CVS, and the difference was incredible. I mean, without CVS, we couldn't go beyond 250 watt. Everything was just absolutely hot, it was impossible. But then we implemented the CVS with reverse carbon and everything, and then we could go to the two kilowatt, and everything was great. So you need CVS. Our, our, our conclusion here is these devices are great. I mean, they are really tiny. If you look at them, they are just absolutely tiny. The own resistance is very low, so that is great. But you need to do CVS. And you don't need to operate at a very high switching frequency. They are good even at low frequency. I mean, it is not that you need to go to 10 megahertz to, to make a good converter. You, make, you can make a good converter at 100 kilohertz. And the reason is that you have low on resistance in there. But as long as you do CVS. If you don't do CVS, huge difference. Okay. Uh, that's going to do it for time first. But let us bring in Thank Professor Kobos again. Great talk. Thank you. And as a token of your appreciation and make you the envy of all of Spain.
like to present you with this certificate of appreciation and we'll take the obligatory picture here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>